Hi. Hi, I'm Jeannie Lithka, a co-director of voter services for the League of Women Voters of Palo Alto. Welcome to each of you tuned in for this highly relevant league and community event. First, a word about the league. There are local leagues, there are five in Santa Clara County, there are state leagues and the national league. We're 100 years old this year, born as women gained the right to vote. Men have become active league members over the years, but we retain the name in honor of the founding. We're a non-partisan organization. We neither support nor oppose candidates or parties, even as our mission is this, to spread democracy. We say we do not have an interest in for whom you vote, just that you vote. Our league works beyond the idea of spreading democracy to seeking to inspire voters to action, to do something to help our struggling democracy, to energize the young to step up, step in and step out, to reshape the state of our nation more surely towards its best self. We are so glad to bring you this event and our speaker, Dr. Didi Kuo. Dr. Kuo is both Associate Director for Research and Senior Research Scholar at the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford. The title of your presentation, Dr. Kuo, is how is the COVID-19 crisis impacting American democracy? I've read a little of what you have written. And as a rank novice in the field, I find a source of comfort and inspiration therein. Here's just one of the gems I came across. If polarization and extreme partisanship in American politics are but skin deep, problems caused by activists and professionals rather than by the electorate as a whole, then reforms are possible. Happily, that is the case. We are delighted to be in the position today of learning about crucial interrelationships in the pursuit of a more participatory and effective democracy in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome, Dr. Kuo. Hi, thank you so much, Jeannie, for that lovely introduction. I wanna thank everyone who's tuning in today and no matter where you are, we of course hope you are safe and healthy. Um, I'm going to be presenting um, a little bit of a discussion of the problems with American democracy that preceded the crisis, ones that we knew were already ongoing, and also discuss some specific election challenges to this November. So without further ado, I've been working at a research center at Stanford on a project on American democracy for a few years now. And since 2013, we've seen the state of American democracy go from somewhat okay to worse, unfortunately. Prior to um, the COVID-19 crisis, the onset of which I guess we could date to maybe February 2020, there were many concerns already about the state of American election infrastructure. First, whether election administration and security could be adequate, especially after accusations and findings of Russian interference in 2016. There are concerns about money and politics and whether or not the world of campaign finance has become a little too deregulated. Concerns about ethics and accountability and the kind of incentives politicians have to be uh, cozy or not with um, businesses and corporations. There are concerns about gerrymandering. And finally, some concerns about the Voting Rights Act, particularly after the Supreme Court struck down one of its most important components, Section 5, um, a few years back. And in fact, after 2018, when uh, the Democrats retook the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi and John Sarbanes' first order of business was a bill called the For the People Act, HR1, which tried to address many of these things, but it did not pass the Senate. So another concern, set of concerns with American democracy has to do with the sort of broader political and social context in which our elections take place. First, po Partisan polarization has been going up for the past 30 years, uh, at least. Economic inequality has also been on the rise with more of a difference between the affluent and wealthy and those in the lower or middle income categories. And in particular, there are claims that the wealthy are more likely to benefit from politics and to get what they want from policymakers. And finally, since Trump took office in 2016, there have been specific concerns about the way he has run the country. For example, there's been a rise in nativist and xenophobic rhetoric, a rise of uh, accusations of corruption and nepotism in the White House. He has attacked many sources of opposition, whether it's within his party or across party lines. He's attacked government institutions and he's attacked the press and the media. 
So going into the 2020 election, there was already a sense that this election was going to be significant and also that it was going to be fraught. Also, Americans are less likely to trust the media these days, they're less likely to trust elections and institutions, um, which makes it harder potentially to mobilize people uh, for something like election security. But now we have a specific crisis caused by the pandemic. And as of March, many states started issuing shelter in place orders saying that it was dangerous for people to congregate or go outside. Joe Biden recently said, mark my words, I think he, Trump, is going to try to kick back the election somehow and come up with a reason why it can't be held. There have been more concerns that Trump is maybe going to delay the election or that you could have some kind of election meltdown, in the words of the UC Irvine professor Rick Hazen, in which both candidates claim victory or refuse to concede. That was actually one of the final events we had at Stanford before shelter in place issues were ordered. Rick Hazen came from Irvine to talk about his book. And I remember at the time in early March when he said that there was the potential for the election to go horribly wrong because of coronavirus, I wondered if that was really the case. Um, but now we are constantly talking, fortunately, about how we might safely be able to hold elections during a pandemic. Stay at home orders, like I said earlier, started in mid-March. So states have gone in a few different directions with their primaries. First, they can continue to hold in-person primary elections as scheduled, like Wisconsin did on April 7th. They could go a totally opposite direction, like New York did, and cancel their primary altogether. But what most states have done is to delay their primary election or allow a longer period of time for mail-in ballots to be collected. Um, I should also say that both of the major parties, the Democrats and Republicans, have postponed their party conventions from the summer. So they were supposed to happen in July. They're now going to happen in mid-August. So we already see that the nature of campaigning right now is very different, that the timeline for campaigning is potentially going to be shorter. Um, and even though a lot of the big primaries had already taken place and we have a clear front runner, we still have many other primary elections to get through. I'm going to go into detail a little bit about the Wisconsin and Ohio primaries right now to give a sense of what the challenges are in the you know, time of pandemic. In the Wisconsin primary, um, there was a primary date of April 7th. Wisconsin Democrats sued the um, Republicans in order to lengthen the amount of time that absentee ballots could be collected and counted. They didn't want to delay the primary per se, although that's definitely how it was spun in the media. Uh, the Wisconsin Republicans instead wanted the primary election deadline enforced, meaning all mail-in and absentee ballots that had been received by April 7th would be counted, but none that were received after that would be counted. The Democrats versus Republicans sued each other. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and on a um, you know sort of party line decision, the Supreme Court said that the original primary date would need to be enforced. Therefore, a lot of people whose mail-in ballots weren't going to make it in on time needed to vote in person. So Wisconsin held open polling sites. They reduced the number of in-person polling precincts, but this led to very long lines and crowded situations at the polls. About 400,000 people ended up voting in person. And as a result, there's been the unfortunate finding that people contracted COVID-19 uh, or coronavirus at the, at the polling sites themselves. So there have been some 19 to 40 cases, depending on which news you're reading, that can be traced back to election day in Wisconsin. So it's been hugely controversial whether or not you should have in-person polling the day of the election. Now, Ohio, which just held its primary yesterday, went in a different direction. It was originally going to have the primary on March 14th. Ohio is a state with a very active League of Women Voters chapter, actually, and a long history of in-person and early voting. Um, instead, Ohio tried to get mail-in ballots up to speed in the few short weeks that they had, um, where they changed the rules so that all voters could request absentee ballots be mailed directly to them. The polls remained open, so you could still go cast a ballot if you needed to. All polling sites had provisional ballots available, um, but turnout was much, much lower than it had been in the past. So in 2016, the last time we had primary elections for president, about 3 million Ohioans voted, whereas on the eve of the primary this year, about 1.9 million people had requested a mail-in ballot and about 1.5 had submitted a ballot. 
There were still people who turned out to vote on election day, however, so we still don't have ultimate turnout numbers. So if we think about the presidential election itself, which is going to take place on one day in November and all states and districts are going to vote at that time, how can we do this in a safe way if the coronavirus um, flu has not yet been resolved, which it's very unlikely to be through vaccine or some other mechanism by then? Uh, well, many advocates have said that a universal mail-in ballot needs to be an option for all voters. There are five states in the country where registered voters receive a ballot in the mail, where basically all elections are conducted over the mail. That's Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Utah, and Hawaii. In 28 other states, they have what's called no excuse absentee voting. This is what we have in California, where you can register as a voter, request to receive your ballot in the mail, you receive it many weeks in advance of the election, and you can either send it back or take it to a polling place on the day of the election. The remaining states, still require an excuse if you want a mail-in ballot. And part of the way this is gonna be challenging is that in places without mail-in ballots, you need a very robust election administration infrastructure if you're going to switch to vote by mail. You need to maintain active voter lists, you need to have people's correct addresses, you need to have a database of their signatures so you can match the signature on their ballot to the signature that you have um, in a government database. And finally, you need a very long period of time and a lot of trained poll workers to count the ballots. This is just a map of what the absentee ballot landscape is by state. I think it's a little outdated. This is from the National Conference of State Legislatures um, because there are Utah and Hawaii are not shaded purple, but you can get a sense of where you still need an excuse. It's in some states where voting is already a challenge for many voters um, through the Midwest and the South. Now I'll quickly talk about some institutes and uh, organizations that have pivoted to talking and advocating election security measures. Um, the first is uh, one that's a joint venture between Stanford and MIT called the Healthy Election Project, spearheaded by Nate Persley, who's a Stanford law professor, and Charles Stewart, who's a political scientist at MIT. This is a data-driven enterprise um, that gives you a lot of the academic research and findings on absentee voting and mail-in ballots. It also provides some data on how elections work across different states and jurisdictions and some recommendations on best practices from the states that already do mail-in voting that other states could learn from. The Brennan Center, which is um, for the Brennan Center for Justice, which typically does a lot of litigation and advocacy, has a petition to tell Congress that we need greater funding for the 2020 election. Um, they have a series of reports. They've been doing a news blast. Some of them were on Meet the Press last Sunday, for example, of a lot of lawyers saying exactly what steps might be taken to make the election more secure and to protect the election this November. Um, Rick Hazen at UC Irvine, who I mentioned earlier, has put together a panel of experts from across not just academia, but also media, policymakers, um, to discuss how you keep elections fair in a time of crisis. And they've come up with a series of recommendations that they're making public. The Sightline Institute is a think tank that works on the Pacific Northwest. They operate out of Seattle and also in Oregon. They have a a really great resource here is Your State Ready that tells you exactly what the rules and regulations are in your state so that you can advocate for changes or you can at least be familiar as a voter with what the rules are. Um, and finally, there's a ad hoc national task force. This is a group of bipartisan members of Congress, former members of Congress, I should say, people who have worked in presidential administrations. There are a lot of um, civil liberties, civil rights advocates on this task force that have also put together an election guide for election officials. Um, I will sum up some of what all of these different resources have said are going to be the main challenges to the November election. You know, when you read through a lot of these proposals and recommendations at this point, it reads like a list of, um, really wishful thinking. And I don't mean that in a, in a pejorative way. I think that we need to be incredibly ambitious in what we're demanding as citizens. But you also know that there, it's going to be a very sort of big struggle to get these things implemented, either at the national level or at the state level in the places that sort of need it the most. Um, but by summarizing, by way of summarizing what a lot of the findings in these reports have been, 
we know that there are going to be a lot of challenges to greater adoption of mail-in ballots by November 2020. First of all, the US Postal Service, which is already an overwhelmed um, and somewhat beleaguered government institute, must handle all absentee ballots. You can't FedEx your ballot. Um, I mean, I suppose you could, but you can do use the Postal Service. Uh, we know that the supply chain must be strong. And by here, the supply chain, I mean, you need to be able to access the paper you need to print ballots on, the envelopes. Um, and apparently there are not actually that many companies that can source these materials. And we have a certain number of states that already do mail-in ballots. If you add a lot of states onto that, it could actually present supply chain uh, issues like the kind we're seeing across the United States for other materials. Um, we know that some voters will need help with their ballots. They either uh, may not be physically able to send their ballots in or to access a mailbox. They might need help with some of the actual balloting itself, either reading it properly or making sure that all of the forms are filled out correctly. Um, and this has, this varies by state, but there are rules about who can help you with your ballot, who can take your ballot from you and send it in on your behalf. Um, so that is a source of, you know, concern for many voters. And finally, many states still continue to have strict rules for absentee ballots. For example, they might require that you have to get your ballot notarized or get your request for an absentee ballot notarized. Um, and there may be just little infrastructure for um, mail-in ballots. I was reading this morning, there's a report that some of the states that are the sort of least prepared for mail-in ballots include Texas, Mississippi, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Missouri. These are states that, um, you know, have a long history of issues with election administration, and it's hard to think about them ramping up in time to conduct an all-mail ballot by November. In addition to the mailing challenges, you also have polling places that you still need to keep open on election day. You'll, be, you'll need to maintain social distancing at the polling places while keeping the polling sites open. You definitely want an adequate number of polling sites so that, say, in a city, people aren't forced to go to one of three places and wait in line all day and be in a huge crowd of people. Um, you want to make sure you keep sick people home, including voters and also poll workers, many of whom tend to be in vulnerable populations uh, to get coronavirus. You also want to reduce possible transmission at the polls themselves. You don't want people touching the same pens. You don't want people touching the same touch machines. Um, and finally, you might want to expand early in-person voting so that people who may be reluctant to vote by mail can still come in a few days before the election. But that, again, requires a lot more robust election administration and also poll workers to be able to work on those days. What does the research say about mail-in ballots? You've probably been following the news and there's a lot of um, controversy, controversy and partisanship over the issue of mail-in ballots. So the question of whether or not they increase turnout, for example, there have been a few political science studies and empirical uh, works of social science showing that they have a small effect on turnout, but not an enormous one. Um, Although the research also shows that in states that do offer no excuse absentee ballots like California, voters tend to like it a lot. So in 2018, only 25% of Americans voted by mail, but in California, about 68% did. Um, so do mail-in ballots increase fraud? This has been a common line of President Trump's, for example. In fact, when Democrats lobbied for greater um, election administration funding in the first CARES Act, he replied by saying, well, if we did that, we'd never get a Republican elected again, um, and then went on to talk about fraud and a bias towards the Democrats. But there's no evidence of systematic fraud using mail-in ballots. There have been a few high-profile cases, um, one in North Carolina in 2018 tied to a sort of low-level Republican operative. Um, but there's no evidence that there's any kind of sustained or planned fraud. And finally, the question is, do they help one party over another? And again, in empirical studies of states with mail-in ballots, there is no advantage for either the Republicans or Democrats. And in fact, there are arguments that can go in both directions. Republican voters actually tend to really use vote by mail when it's an option, um, even though there's also evidence that when you make it easier to access a ballot, it can help Democrats. So it really goes either way, and there's no clear evidence indicating that one party benefits over the other. But what are going to be some of the challenges to implementing some of the best practices and to security is to making the election more secure? Well, first, we know that congressional legislation already gets embroiled in a lot of debate. 
There are debates about whether or not we needed to make elections more secure against foreign interference after 2016, and a lot of these discussions got sort of tied up in the broader impeachment debate. Trump himself has also sort of demonized the Postal Service on many occasions. He has recently threatened to defund it. It's not clear if he actually could do that, but the, the fact that he is sort of antagonizing the Postal Service could go far to erode trust or erode congressional support for it. And finally, you know, Trump and Republicans claim that mail-in ballots are vulnerable to fraud, which is sort of part of a broader Republican talking point about voter accessibility and fraud in general. But there are issues with um, a partisan lens in interpreting some of these balloting issues. And finally, some challenges just have to do with the culture that we have around election night. We have a 24-hour news cycle that typically demands that winners be declared the night of the election, not just for the presidency, but for all lower offices, the state, the house, et cetera. Um, and what all of these election experts are saying in these reports is that the media has to stop this, that if we really want a free and fair election in November, the media has to commit to not announcing a winner on election night, has to sort of do a huge PSA to all voters that it's just gonna take us weeks before we might have an answer. Um, and the problem with, with not waiting is that candidates could both declare themselves winners. You could see a world in which the swing states the returns are coming in incredibly slowly. They look really promising for Trump one minute, really promising for, in all likelihood, Joe Biden the next minute. And both candidates say, I think I'm the winner. And they refuse to budge even after there's more ballot counting. So that's the situation we really want to avoid. Um, now, let's just zoom out a little bit and think about how all of these challenges um, should be situated or thought of in the broader context of election administration in the United States. We know that American elections are not conducted like other elections. Many other countries have a centralized election commission, often a nonpartisan or independent group of people who oversee the elections, they make the rules, um, they try to equalize the voting experience regardless of where you live. In the United States, we have like a very, very decentralized landscape for election administration, where we have roughly 10,000 separate election jurisdictions. The 50 states create their own rules for elections. Many of them delegate down to the very local level about what the ballot will look like, where you'll go, how many days in advance you have to register. Um, so that already makes it a little bit confusing for American voters because your voting experience is highly dependent on where you live. Um, we also have partisan election administration, which is um, sort of a no-no if you are working on democracy promotion, for example. You would never tell a country that is adopting elections to have partisan election administration. But in the United States, we run our elections through the 50 secretaries of state. Um, I think with the exception of one or two states, they're all elected. And in the other ones, they're appointed. So they tend to come from one party or another. That doesn't necessarily mean they do things to favor their party, but it does mean that they are, sometimes the election rules are viewed as a little bit suspect, um, and it also can be highly predicted by other partisan positions on issues. And finally, we have sort of historically unique elections in the United States um, in that we have a history of slavery followed by um, sort of emancipation and then the implementation of strict segregation policies in the South that banned or effectively banned Black Americans from voting. And in the United States, that continues to dominate a lot of our discourse around elections because access to the ballot has never been equal in the United States. And even today, it remains um, very different for some minority groups versus other populations. Democrats have typically been the party that favors greater access to the ballot, at least in the post-civil rights era, um, whereas Republicans tend to favor um, voter identification laws or measures to reduce fraud, but many of these measures tend to put an extra burden on workers when coming to the polls. So I don't want to be pessimistic necessarily. I think that this actually, this crisis is a time to really highlight what our vulnerabilities are and to think about how we might fix them moving forward. Um, in the immediate term, just like every other election, an all-male election is going to really rely on turnout. Voters have to be motivated to vote. They have to see that it's important to vote. They have to be willing to take time to learn what the new rules are, to request a ballot, et cetera. So any get-out-the-vote effort is going to be um, 
hugely important, especially for groups like young people, people who are away on college campuses, people who have moved away temporarily in search of potential job opportunities or something. They all need to be able to figure out how they can vote in their hometowns. Um, it's also important for us to just keep reminding our representatives that this issue is critical. So reaching out to your member of Congress, this is maybe not important for us who live in the Bay Area. We have legislators who are already fully on board with the idea of greater election protection, but at the very least trying to um, be a vociferous advocate for bipartisan measures to increase election security will go far, I think. And after the election, regardless of what happens, I do think that the good thing about the past few years is a lot more Americans are ready to advocate to different kinds of political reforms. They're ready to see something happen with the state of American democracy and um, we can be proactive about this. So if we are unhappy with how elections are administered in the United States, we can be part of movements or groups or organizations that are fighting to clean up election administration. We can also advocate different types of political reform that might change the incentives politicians have to campaign certain ways, that might go far to change the number of parties we have, um, the way that politicians uh, negotiate across the aisle once they're elected to Congress. There are many different reform options on the table. I'm not going to go into detail about them, but I do think this could help spur more of a movement for reform. And finally, all of the concerns we had about disinformation on social media, for example, and on about online campaigns, um, sometimes we're in the realm of the theoretical before this, but what we're now facing is that a lot of the campaigning that's going to happen is going to be online. People who are campaigning for office for the president or the Senate or the House are not going to be able to go shake hands with people and have large rallies like they're accustomed to. So hopefully this will also really incentivize people to seek out good information online, to be good consumers. Also, it'll force sort of the government and the tech companies and the media to all come together and talk about best practices for how you cover an election under these circumstances. That is um, everything for now, but I'm excited for the q and I do want to say if you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A box um, and the question will be fielded to me. I'm sorry for not saying that earlier at the, at the outset. Um, thanks so much. Let me unmute. Hi. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Miller and I'm a co-director with Jeannie of the Voter Services part of, of um, the League of Women Voters in Palo Alto. And I'm going to sort of moderate the questions coming from the Q&A. So the first one was uh, from Alice Smith, who's a very active person in our league, who says, would litigation help in the five states that don't allow voting by mail? And what about suing the states that force notarizing of signatures? Um, she actually says federal law under Article 1, Section 4 could resolve this if pressure put on the Senate to pass HR1, I assume is what she means, HR1? Yes. Yeah. So I think litigation is going to be a huge tool. Um, litigation is already one of the main ways we tend to resolve election administration issues, for better or worse, even though it's sort of costly and takes a really long time. Um, there are already instances of League of Women Voters and uh, the Democratic Party suing in a lot of different states on related issues. For example, there's a lawsuit in Florida after Floridians voted to restore felon voting rights, the legislature sort of took away those rights um, by implementing new restrictions basically on whether you could vote. And so the there are groups that are suing to restore those rights as the people wanted. I'm not sure of specific lawsuits to to force vote by mail. But um, I think the hope right now is that many other states have already relaxed their requirements. And the, I think the hope is that public pressure combined with some threat of congressional action um, or enforcement of rules would force the other states to do it as well. But I think litigation will happen if the states don't relax those rules. OK. Um Someone else asked, could you talk about proportional representation and how it might help our democracy? Why is it so much resisted? I'm, I, I'm not sure what the, that's referring to if it's, I don't think it's different systems like ranked choice voting, proportional representation. I'm happy to talk about all those things actually. So right now the way we elect um, 
we elect our representatives to the House is through, well, and also to the state legislatures, is through what's called first past the post plurality voting, which means a bunch of candidates run against each other and whoever gets the most votes wins. Um, and so you could only get, you know, 40% of the vote, but if you got more than every other candidate, you're elected. It's also called a winner take all election. This is a voting system that typically produces two parties because third party candidates just become less and less viable over time. Um, this has been empirically documented actually a long time ago, like in the 50s by a French political scientist. Um, and it's been very true in a lot of countries ever since, countries that have first past the post elections are dominated by two parties. In a system of proportional representation, what you do is have multiple members elected from each district. So you make the voting districts usually much larger. You elect, say, three to five people from each one. And that way, you usually get more of a mix of partisanship. So that way, you could elect you know, four people who come from two main parties and a fifth person who's from a third party. And in the legislature itself, you then get a distribution of seats in terms of who the parties, which goes to which parties, that reflects the national vote share. In the United States, because of first past the post, we often get what's called a perverse result, where in 2012, for example, Democrats won about 1.5 million more votes in the aggregate to the House, but Republicans had like a 33 seat advantage. Um, and that doesn't happen every time, but when you have proportional elections, you get sort of a nice match between the proportion of votes that each party received and the actual number of seats that's allocated in the legislature. I think that we're a long way from convincing Americans that proportional representation is good or necessary. But I think in the meantime, an interim thing sort of step is ranked choice voting, where instead of just picking the one candidate you like, you get to rank order your candidates. And there's some evidence that um, this is a system that forces candidates to sound a little bit more moderate because they're trying to win it sort of forces a majoritarian principle rather than just a plurality one. If you want 50% of the votes, then you need to reach across the aisle or sound a little bit like you can appeal to other parties. Um, but these are both policies that are proposals that are being debated uh, at the national level, which is a promising sign. Mm. Are there other ones besides that? I've heard of um, some, some others mentioned besides ranked choice, like, a, oh gosh. No. <laughs> well, it seems to be the most, there are any number of different configurations, actually, one that sort of like ivory tower academics end up talking about a lot is the German system, which is called a mixed member system, where they have some proportion of seats that's allocated through first past the post, and then some proportion that's allocated through a proportional party list, which means in practice that you get to vote for one representative, but you also select a party. So ultimately, um, when selecting seats for the legislature, you have everyone got to select their representative, but you also have um, these top-up seats that equalize the distribution of seats. Now that system is confusing just in general, uh, the, and there's really no proposal for that to be adopted in the United States, but it is a sort of mathematically and technically a very nice system in terms of equalizing the distribution of party preferences. Um, so there are alternatives to either ranked choice voting or to a sort of pure proportional representation system. Okay, um, there's another question just about overcoming Citizens United and what can we do about clean money and is, is the only solution to change the composition of the Supreme Court or? <laughs> well, unfortunately, it seems, well, I won't say yes. I mean, ultimately the precedent or the um, sort of legal interpretation right now of equating money with speech makes it very unlikely that restrictions on money will be upheld by the Supreme Court. So if we wanted to say, you know, you can only give so much to a campaign, um, that would be probably struck down. But one thing we can do, given the rise of these super PACs, so super PACs tend to be um, much less transparent than a regular political PAC, which a, a PAC is something where you have to uh, sort of document yourself with the FEC, you have to file expenses, you have to say who gave money. Um, a super PAC is supposed to operate independently. This is like where the so-called independent expenditures happen. They're not connected 
I mean, they often are in practice, but they're not supposed to be connected to specific candidates. And as a result, because they're independent organizations, they don't have to report where their money comes from or how much money they have. Um, they don't have to file with the FEC. And so I think that HR1, for example, tried to clamp down on, on super PACs and C4 organizations by basically requiring them to report more about where their money comes from and um, how much they're spending. Mm. Okay. Um, another uh, question I had was just um, in California, uh, you're probably aware of the Voters Choice Act, which was implemented this year in Santa Clara County and um, last election in five counties. Now it's up to 15 counties. But um, so when you said, you know, there's not vote by mail in California, there is in 15 counties, we have 100% vote by, by mail. Mm balloting it's just uh getting it into the other counties which have to one by one decide to do it and so i'm just wondering if the 400 million that the but that was budgeted by congress if california counties might be going for some of that are you aware of any of this my understanding of how that money is being allocated is that it's in the form of block grants to the states and so the states can decide what to do with it um so I think the hope was that they would use it to sort of beef up their election administration, but it's very subjective and the states can decide how they want to do that, basically. Um, I have, I am not sure how California will make a determination about how to spend that money. I'm not sure if it's up to sort of the local level or if sort of Governor Newsom makes a decision, um, but it does seem like there has been a lot of attention on getting Californians ready for 2020 and making sure that our vote by mail infrastructure is robust, even where there's not all mail balloting. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, um, people, oh shoot, I hadn't scrolled down here. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that always gets me. Um, where would the monetary burden be placed for mail-in voting this November? Would the federal government pay for the delivery of the ballots in states without programs currently, or would the burden be placed on individual states to cover the costs? That is an excellent question. I mean, I think that that's linked to bigger questions about who's going to bear the cost of any number of sort of hits to the economy right now. Um, I think the hope and what a lot of the organizations that I mentioned in my talk, a lot of what they're advocating is that the federal government provide the necessary money for states to at least get to some minimum capacity for all mail ballots. It would require a lot of money. They're also, I mean, in conjunction with funding the states and their ability to conduct the elections, you also need to fund the Postal Service because the fact is that tons of ballots go through the Postal Service. You need the Postal Service to be efficient. Um, you need it to have the capacity to handle all of all of the ballots for November. So it, it would be a request to Congress, from what I understand. Um, in other words, the states that are sort of willing to ramp up their administrative capacities through funding it are probably not the states that really need it the most, if that makes sense. Where there's a political will to do it, you're less likely to need congressional intervention. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else is here. Uh, Nancy Peterson says she has two questions. One is, I'll start with one and get to the other. What's your impression of Stacey Abrams' organization Fair Fight and the potential for its impact? Oh, okay, I'll start with that. Um, uh, I think it's excellent. I, for a long time, um, after the Republicans started the battle for voter ID at the state level, so this has been since, since 2010, although honestly, George W. Bush directed Alberto Gonzalez to look at, you know, look for instances of voter fraud in 2000. So this has been a long-term project by the Republican Party, but after 2010, it really ramped up. And that's when you had like 14 new states adopting pretty strict voter ID requirements um, out of claims of voter fraud. So I think it has actually been slow, a slow response to that. Like the Democratic Party has not necessarily been super vocal until very recently about the need for um, greater ba ballot access or you know, a, to fully rebut the effects of voter identification laws. So I think the good thing about Stacey Abrams' organization, and in fact, the great thing about her entire candidacy in Georgia as governor, was that it was so focused on voting rights. And 
uh, sort of recalling to Americans that these voting rights have really taken a long time to win and to secure in the first place, and that they can also be sort of eroded in ways that are really subtle. And for her to place voting rights as, at the forefront of all election issues as a sort of policy agenda item, I think is very, uh, very good for democracy, you know, sort of normatively important, but also pretty, for pretty good strategically as well for her. And I think that that's part of her campaigning now to Joe Biden saying, it's pretty interesting to watch actually, it's so rare that we see this, but she's touting herself as the person that Joe Biden should select. And I think that a lot of that is based on the fact that she thinks it's important to bring these issues to the national stage um, and that she is a particularly good face for these issues. So I think at the very least, she's getting this issue into the national debate and that's important, regardless of where her candidacy goes. Um, the second question by Nancy was, do you have an opinion about how elimination of the electoral college might impact turnout? Yes, I, um, that's a near and dear sort of topic for me. I was going to have a slide in here about the Electoral College, um, but it didn't seem super relevant to, to me necessarily. I do think that um, it is highly relevant, the issue of the Electoral College, because in the United States, we think that like basically stateness, stateness is an important organizing principle for politics. And in some ways it is, right? We live in states and states have a lot of power. But in other ways, you know, living in one state should not give you more of a political voice than living in another state. And we know that uh, the Electoral College does exactly that. That if you live in Wyoming, your vote matters about 17 times more than it does to us here in California, simply because their state, their votes are aggregated through the two senators that they definitely have allocated. and ours are diluted by the two senators that we have. Um, so a lot of the electoral college debates are sort of fundamentally tied to the fact of the Senate. But I will say the electoral college in and of itself also creates these awful incentives for presidential campaigns where presidents feel very responsive to certain states like swing states um, and basically can ignore or take for granted depending on which party they're in other states that are going to be clearly in one party or the other. As a result, um, people's calculus of whether or not to vote in a presidential election often comes down to where they live. And it, that's really not the way democracy should operate. I mean, you should be able to just vote for who you want for president and know that it'll count. So I don't necessarily see a constitutional amendment to change the Electoral College happening in my lifetime. But I do think that um, if you got another result like 2016, or 2000, when the person who won more popular votes still lost the election. There could be a real movement to do what's called the National Popular Vote Compact, which is an interstate compact to have states up to 270 electors declare that they will pledge all of their votes to the candidate who wins the popular vote. That in effect makes it a national popular election rather than a state by state electoral college. It basically nullifies like the purpose of the electoral college through this sort of backdoor way. Um, so I could see increased momentum for that if you get another one of these kinds of wrong outcomes. But Americans are very reluctant to change their institutions. And even though a lot of Americans think the electoral college is kind of like weird and antiquated, they also don't necessarily support changing it um, if you look at survey evidence. So I find that to be a, a sort of bizarre anomaly in our institutions. You know, you said something I thought was interesting about um, that we run our elections through, you know, all the secretaries of state who are partisan elected officials, and that if you were going to be advising another foreign country that was setting up a de democratic system, you would never advise them to have such a system. Should we be doing something about that? I mean, why don't we have a more national electoral system, and could we? So the Constitution um, says that the House, that Congress um, needs to let the states the determine the time, manner, and place of elections. So there's, we have nothing in our sort of original documents that creates federal oversight of elections. And if you add on top of that, the fact that we've had sort of major electoral crises, especially after 2000, um, I think that the states are just so accustomed to being like in charge of the election apparatus that it's unclear what institutional form 
you know, federal oversight would even take. So the Election Administration Commission, um, the EAC was created by the Help America Vote Act, which was passed after Bush v. Gore. And I think it passed in 2002 after also a high profile bipartisan commission to investigate what went wrong in the 2000 election. And a lot of that commission ended up saying we need more federal sort of consistency or oversight or something. But the EAC as a commission has been marred by political infighting because it's supposed to have three Republicans and three Democrats um, who apparently just really don't get along over the history of the commission. Um, it hasn't been funded properly by Congress and it ultimately can't really do much. We have a few sort of the story of commissions in US history is we often have federal commissions that aren't actually empowered with implementation authority over their rules. So they can ask the states to try to meet sort of certain kinds of like minimum qualifications for election standards, but they can't necessarily enforce them. Um, so there are many other countries that adopted central oversight and agencies um, of elections and you just don't really see the political momentum for that in the United States. Oh, Kathy, you're muted. Um, because of a decrease of American confidence in elections from because of media polarization, misinformation, the election system is under tremendous dis stress. What can we do to educate our electorate? Sorry, could you say that one more time? Because of the, the system is under stress? Stress on our, um, our lack of confidence in our elections because of media, polarization, misinformation. The election system is under stress. What can we do to educate our electorate? That's very difficult. Um, we have a project on cybersecurity policy uh, or you know, cyber related policy at Stanford that has been trying to work on disinformation and how you get people to, I guess, be better consumers or also how you get the tech platforms to stop allowing disinformation. And it's just a very difficult nexus right now of a sort of wild west of what people's incentives are and who's responsible for consuming information in the right way or providing information in the right way. Um, so I think the issue is not necessarily educating voters, but instead empowering voters and citizens to realize that the one thing we really can do in a time when everything feels hopeless is vote. I mean, we held an election during the Civil War. We held an election during the you know, World War II. We have held elections under terrible, terrible circumstances. Um, and we need to hold an election again. And we need to do everything we can to make sure that the election happens in a way, unfolds in a way that feels legitimate and free and fair. Um, and I think that for voters, that means having to sort of have faith in the system and knowing that casting a vote is like the, the really the most vocal thing you can do as a citizen right now. I do think that if there's one thing we could do to help voters trust the process more, it would be if there were a commitment on the part of national leaders, but also people who work in media, um, people who work in tech to say, to try to allow for, um, you know, all of the strange contingencies of this moment. In other words, to say, we are not gonna declare a winner on election night. You know, our coverage of election night is just going to be about the candidates and whatever, but we're going to take like, allow a few weeks for all of the ballots to be counted before we even make some prediction. So if we got away from the horse race politics element of that, or if, um, all of the candidates could agree that they're still going to, you know, do some kind of airtime equivalence so that when you have people who are campaigning in very difficult circumstances, um, that the media still make sure to give airtime to, to all of the candidates for discussing political things beyond just the presidential debates. Um, in other words, I think some people are worried that because of coronavirus, there's constant coverage of the crisis, but no coverage of the election itself. So understanding that we still need to devote some mental space and energy to thinking about the election per se, um, outside of the context of the crisis is also important. But I think if there's a message of like, this election is going to happen, we need all voters to turn out in whatever way they can, I, that's the most important thing. 
Uh, there's a question from Diane Rolf. What is your opinion regarding finding people who do not vote in a federal election, like a few countries do? Should the U.S. find non-voting citizens? So there, so it's true that elections are mandatory in some places, like in Australia. Um, and so in Australia, you know, an example of a liberal Western democracy. So it's a little bit strange. Now, I do think that the fine tends to be something very low. Um, but it still does create a culture in which the vast majority of Australians turn up to vote. In the US, it's pretty likely that would be unconstitutional. So there have been um, some, there was some case from like the 1850s in Mississippi or something a very, very long time ago where there was some effort to make voting mandatory and it failed in the courts. And I think that it just runs so counter to our idea of liberalism. And by that, I just mean like individual rights. You know, We think that you should have the right not to vote and that's just as important to exercise as your right to vote. Um, but it would be nice if there were uh, maybe greater social, I say social sanctioning, which sounds very punitive, but I mean creating cultures of civic expression in which voting is central, I think can go far in, in motivating and mobilizing people. So maybe not necessarily punishing those who don't vote, but it, because we see through also through surveys and stuff, people lie all the time. They still wanna be seen as voters. They lie on surveys, they lie on like Facebook, they'll say I went to vote and like we know from the numbers that they didn't. People wanna be voters. So if there are just more ways to sort of verify that people voted and encourage them to vote, I think that that's good. I think that's also why it's so important to increase um, access to the ballot, because a lot of times it is just hard to vote as an American. Mm. Um, I just wanted to add a few comments from Alice Smith about uh, that we should all look at votewriters.org that's helping with ending voter ID um, or helping people to get their IDs. Uh, mm, she okay. mentioned a movie called Suppressed. And then I'm actually not sure what she was referring to here. Under Article 1, Section 4, she's saying that something you said was wrong, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> Do you know what that would be? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I have a pocket constitution somewhere in my oh, office. Oh, here it is. Time, place, and manner for senators and representatives. The Congress may at any time by law make or alter such rec regulations. Oh, okay. So which regulations are we talking about? I'm We're sorry. talking about whether the states who has authority over elections, basically. Oh, and right. I was saying that the states have been granted that authority. And Alice is pointing out that Congress can also change that. Um, so that's true. But, you know, the federal government has just not exercised its Article 1, Section 4 power in a way that centralizes control of elections. Um, so there have been efforts to strengthen the EAC, that commission that I, that I talked about before, in many subsequent pieces of legislation, like after Barack Obama was elected, he created a commission, actually I think it was after his second election. So in 2012, there was a commission on long lines because there were sort of notoriously awful waiting times at polling places then. And um, that commission also recommended greater, at the very least national coordination among the states so that they could share voter registration lists um, and a lot more coordination at the very least, and also to, to make the EAC more robust. And it just sort of, I mean, it was bipartisan, but Congress just didn't do much to ensure that those recommendations were implemented or adopted. Okay. Um, someone asked Julie Cardillo, uh, do you have an opinion about the National Democratic Redistricting Committee organized by Obama and Eric Holder that's focused on combating gerrymandering? And the league also has a gerrymandering project going on. Um, yeah, gerrymandering is tough. On the one hand, there's, um, on the one hand, we know that Republican legislatures in particular, and also Democratic legislatures did it too, it's just not as many of them sort of won out in the, after 2010. We know that partisans have drawn lines that favored them. And that's why in a lot of the litigation that has followed the redrawing of lines after 2010, the redrawing actually led to more Democrats being elected. Um, but we also know that given how Americans live, like basically the urban, suburban, and rural divides, that a lot of places where you're going to draw lines are just going to be, um, they're, they're going to be either heterogeneous enough that it's sort of hard to tell who's advantaged, or they're going to just be a lot of places that, that vote Republican, at least for now, um, sort of how we thought about the, our politics as of 2010. So 
in a lot of social science, there's actually not much um, support for the idea that gerrymandering is the root of our current political crisis, like polarization um, and, and any number of other things. That said, I can see it being likely that the uh, after this current census, that a lot of states will adopt independent nonpartisan redistricting commissions along the lines of what California has. Um, already in 2018, a lot of states through ballot initiatives adopted that kind of redistricting commission and Americans really don't like partisan drawing of lines. So even though I'm not sure if it'll have a huge impact on American democracy, I think it could go far to restore legitimacy in the process of district districting. Um, and that if the results are not that different, then it's, you know, it's probably better to have nonpartisan redistricting than not. Um, I, th I know we have to wrap up shortly and Myra wants to speak briefly. Um, but there was something you said at the very, or I guess it was part of Jeannie's intro that you had written something about how the divisiveness of this country is and partisanship and such is only skin deep. And so we can do something about it. it how do we know that the, it's really only skin deep? <laughs> um, I, there is a lot of evidence that um, Americans are very fed up with polarization at the national level and that partisanship has become a new, um, a new way we divide each other because it's a heuristic for a lot of other things. I guess, in other words, you know, it's good that America is moving to a place where maybe race is less of a dividing line in the way we perceive each other or any number of other cleavages, religion, et cetera, that used to influence our society. But there's a lot of evidence that partisanship is basically just a new way of doing that. Um, I do think that there are a lot of people who take their signals from elite rhetoric and elite leadership. And that if there were efforts to depolarize at the national level and to do a lot of what Americans have demanded that they want, which is more negotiation and compromise, um, more effective governance and you know, greater exercise of leadership that seems less coarse or less sort of hateful than we currently have, that American voters would be more satisfied. That's the direction they want things to go. And so I'm not necessarily sure that polarization is skin deep per se. I do think that it's still tied to divisions that matter. But at the very least, if we could um, try to deflate what partisanship means and try to root it in actual just policy differences that our leaders can talk about without having a sort of winner take all scorched earth mentality that that would go far in changing how the electorate ask, acts as well. Great. Um, well, I think we have to kind of wrap up and Myra wanted to say something here at the end. Myra, are you, uh, are you there? Uh, we need to unmute you. I'm unmuted and I am live. Hi everyone. <laughs> Hi Myra. Uh, hello. Well, first of all, I just want to say Amazing! Thank you so much to Dr. Oh, Quill for this presentation and and uh, candid responses to all the questions. There are so many questions that came in. We we don't didn't even have time. I think we, we could have kept going for like another half hour, an hour, if everything was able, if everyone was able to be heard. But thank you for those who also send in your questions. And um, I just want to say that this was a, a fantastic, a, somewhat of an experiment because we're all treading in new, in new waters today. Um, I'm the, have, have taken over chairing a sort of a brand new committee on, on bringing more events and member engagement to our league. And we started this right before the quarantine and the shutdown and shelter in place. And we had originally thought we could, we could do a, an actual luncheon, which someday in the future, some, somehow we hope to be able to do that. But in the interim, we didn't want to just put everything on pause and invited uh, Didi Quo to come and uh, do this virtual webinar for us. And I, I'm so glad we did. Um, I want to also let you know that there'll be a random a sampling sent out to some of you, a good percentage of you will get a survey monkey. Um, please be on the lookout for that in the next couple of days. Um, we would love to get your feedback because this, this is just the beginning, not the end. Um, we hope to continue to bring um, more relevant and informative um, speakers to the league and perhaps Didi will come back and speak to us again, maybe post-election. <laughs> 
and uh, give us her, your take on, and we'll have many, many things to talk about at that point in time. Um, and so please do fill out the Survey Monkey. If for some reason you are not one of the random people who get the Survey Monkey, you can still give us your feedback. Um, you can send an email to LWV Palo Alto office at gmail.com. I don't know if I'm um, Kathy, if you want to put that into chat, will everyone have, have visibility to the chat or not? I can change it so that they do. Yeah, maybe, maybe now put that in. Um, so it's our, it, it just, just in case yeah. you want to give us more information or feedback, the more the better, because we really want to make these meaningful um, and informative to the, to the whole league and would love to hear what your thoughts are and, and what you'd like to see us bring to you. Um, you can also always visit our website, lwvpaloalto.org for more information. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and I know we got a few questions this morning about um, whether or not this is being video recorded. I think you probably all saw that button come up at the beginning that you agreed and know that it's being video recorded. We will make the link available. Um, our next e-blast will go out on May 4th and we'll put that link in that um, mailing. So be on the lookout for that in your, e in your email as well. Um, again, thank you, Didi, and thank you all participants um, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Thank you, everyone, and stay healthy. Take care. You too. Bye. 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 -bye.